It's just amazing to work on the web. I've been a web developer for 15 years now, something like that. And when I started on the web, I just realized we have a great opportunity here, and it's an opportunity we should never waste. And that's why we hope we can inspire you to help us with that, to get a lot more traction for the open web in Brazil already. So far, we've been at Fizzle the last few days in uh, um, Porto Alegre. And it's just incredible to see how much people like open source here and how much cool hacking and how much cool like um, information on the web and free information on the web is being created that we never heard or hear about because we can't read your language. But it's just wonderful to see that people here are seeing the internet as a gift and not as something to play angry birds on. So, let me quickly introduce myself. Uh, I live in London, England. I'm originally from Germany, but I've been 14 years in England, which makes me a Londoner. When my girlfriend gets very bored, she does things like that to me. So, that's, that was doing a job, uh, doing an interview with the office, which was rather strange, but what can you do? I'm Chris Heilman, I'm Code Poet on Twitter. That's where you get me most of the time, because I'm traveling a lot, so my email is always overflowing. And it's christianheilman.com, is the blog. And these slides and everything we're going to talk about today are already available online on SlideShare, so I'm going to tweet them out later in case you want to reuse them. Now, you might have guessed that in London right now the Olympic Games are going on. And as we just can see, there's a football match. And I learned yesterday that actually no country has a chance against Brazil in football. Because what you have, you have the Hulk working for you. And I think that's just hilarious that somebody has a name like Hulk. That's so cool. I hope they don't make them angry, although that might be funny actually to see on the football pitch. So that's me. Uh, you can reach me anytime online. You can talk to me in person later on as well. And now I'm going to quickly introduce my colleague John here. Hello, yes. Uh, my name is John Hammy. Um, I'm a writer's man on Twitter and I have my own blogspot.com. Um, I believe uh, probably the engineer of the Put Together. I've been on the project since November of last year which kind of makes me an old-timer, uh, at least in the fast-moving world we're in. Um, I'm based in Mountain View, California, at Mozilla's main headquarters, oh. this lovely building up on our, on our uh, video right-hand side. Um, and I'm also a musician. Um, so, back to this. Good. Um, we got the advertisement for the musician in, so you can hire him for your birthday party or for your company party later on. Okay, so what is the web? The web to me is absolutely amazing. This is a, a map of the internet and connectivity, how it is in different countries. These people can all talk to each other over the internet. And I think that's incredible that the world has become so small in the last few, like 20 years, that we can now speak worldwide to people. We can speak to people in China, in Africa, I can speak to people in Brazil without sitting on the phone and paying lots of money on it. We're just all online and we can do this. I wish all of that was completely right, but we're not quite there yet. But I think it's quite interesting to see that uh, uh, Australia and these things are not as good connected as America and England. And it's quite bizarre seeing the differences between those. What the web is also, it gives people a voice. That's why I started on the web. I used to be a radio journalist, I did the news in a radio station, and that was cool, but I realized nobody who has something interesting to say gets on the news. It's only people that pay for it, or people that commit a crime, and then actually get reported and come on the news that way. So, when I started the internet, and I started working on the internet, I realized that anybody who has something to say can go online and can get people listen to him. So it gives us a voice, especially in countries where the government controls newspapers and the government controls the TV stations. The internet gives you much more interesting information about that country. And it's easy to publish on the web. It's not magic, like you don't have to be an expert, you don't have to know 
how to print a newspaper or make a TV program, you just open a blog post and you start writing. You just go on, on Skype and you talk to people. Like being a publisher is as easy as being a consumer on the web. This is a wonderful picture of a child who for the first time in his life hears. He's a deaf kid that has a hearing aid and for the first time his eyes open like I can hear, I can get the world from out there. And I found a lot of people in countries where the media isn't free using the internet for the first time getting the same experience and we should cherish that I think. The web is also for everybody. It's a simple release process. As I said, getting an HTML document on the web is not magic. You don't have to go to university and learn a certain way how to write software and how to compile it. You just write the thing, put it on an FTP, or copy and paste it into paste bin, and all of a sudden the information is on the internet. They're simple technologies. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are not hard. They could get confusing, especially JavaScript has really random things in it, but they're not really hard to learn for somebody who just wants to have a go at them. So you don't have to be an expert to be on the web. We always make fun of websites that look horrible or actually have coding errors in them. But at the same time, it's good that these people are allowed to be on the web as well. Because when there's bad websites out there, the ones that we build get more money. So we actually have something to complain about. So Mozilla, in its very core, is there for the web. We are a non-for-profit organization. We don't have shareholders. We don't have. We don't make money with the stuff that we do. Uh, I used to come from a large corporation that is purple and starts with a Y before I started at Mozilla. And there, everything I did had to make money, or we didn't do it anymore. At Mozilla, everything we do has to do some good, or we don't do it anymore. And that's much more fun to me. And it's very, very important that we have an organization like Mozilla there that can do things that the Googles and the Microsoft and the Apples can't do because we don't have shareholders that tell us, like, where's the money in that? So, we have a great project. If you have kids or if you have parents, well, we obviously have parents, but if you have parents who want to go on the internet and don't know about internet technologies and don't know what the whole thing means, there's a project called Mozilla Webmaker, which turns consumers of the web into doers of the web. People who write their first websites, people who write their first blog posts, people who understand how to upload an image to the internet. These kind of things are explained in that process and there's a kind of with the code party going with it, there's lots of events going on with it. And one of the tools we provide you with is, for example, Mozilla Symbol. This is an editor, a live editor, that shows you the HTML on the, right, uh, on the left hand side, and on the right hand side, it shows you the map. And it tells you when there's errors in there. So instead of just saying that there's an error, it explains what the error is about. And you can fix it for yourself. And this is a program we built for kids, but also for people who just want to start with it. I found myself writing code from scratch is much harder than just debugging something else. Most of the time we copy and paste code from somebody else and mess around with it until it works. And that's exactly what Mozilla Thimble is about. You can write your own tests in there, you can write your own examples for it and get people excited about web technologies in a very interactive way. The same with, pop, uh, with Popcorn. Popcorn is a JavaScript library that allows you, and an editor, as you can see here, to upload video to the web and mix it with web content. So if you have a video of your president giving a speech and you want to show a map at a certain time, they now have an editor to do that rather than having to do it in the video itself. So it brings video into the web and interacts with other parts of the web in video itself, and that's HTML5 video, of course. So, as I said before, it's simple technologies, they're not hard. HTML structures the content. Is this a paragraph? Yes, it has a P tag around it. CSS defines the look and feel, and that used to be just colors and fonts and, and layout, but now it's also animation, it's transition, it's all the cool things that in the past we could only do in C++, we can now do in CSS, in the technology and in the syntax that people already know. And JavaScript adds the interactivity. It doesn't make things so beautiful, but also makes like, things change when you click on them, loads new things in, these kind of things. So these are the main three technologies that you use for the web, and we don't need any other anymore because HTML5 is so wonderfully rich that we can do cool stuff with it. So one of the main things that Mozilla is doing, or I'm doing in Mozilla, is uh, I'm part of Mozilla Developer Network, which is a documentation piece about any technology of the web. 
So we have a wiki there with everything in there. Everything you need to know about web development, when you get stuck, you will find there. There's lots of them out there, but the only thing that MDN does, it comes with an edit button. So if you don't like something, or you find a mistake, or you want to make a demo, you press the edit button and you go for it. You don't have to be part of Google, be part of Microsoft, be somebody known to actually help with that. Anybody is invited. It's like Wikipedia for code examples and code documentation. And it's very, very important that people realize that they're the only independent one out there. Which brings me to uh, a request. We need you to help us with that. We do the whole thing in, uh, in English. I also try to say parts of it in German but we don't have anything in Brazilian Portuguese. And you know Brazilian Portuguese and you know English, which is good. So it would be nice if you helped us with translating. The new wiki uh, that's coming out, it came out yesterday actually at Feasley, we did a translation starting, has a translation tool. So all you have to do is pick, say, add translation, pick Portuguese Brazil, and start translating. And it's again a simple editor. It has the, the content on the left-hand side and your editor on the right-hand side. So you can translate directly from one to another, much like Facebook did it in the past as well, which is pretty sweet. And so please help us with that, because we want to do a lot in Brazil, and we realize that having documentation only in English is not good enough. And all of us learning Brazilian Portuguese first is going to take too long. So we thought we had, we'd work with you and give you a translation tool instead. So. A bit of history. Why, what, is, what has Mozilla done? Why are we here and why are we important for the web? And the big one was the big blue. When I started on the internet in 97, Internet Explorer was the only browser out there. It was the only browser that people used and the internet was only used in offices and schools and in places that could afford them. And Mozilla came in and actually built Firefox. And with that we started a revolution that allowed for other browsers to come as well and be standards based rather than be part of an operating system like Internet Explorer was and actually allow you to open source, have web content and build web content and view web content. And that was very important because without us being there and having built Firefox back then, I'm quite sure the internet would not be what it is today. It would not be the Facebooks out there. We would not be allowed. There would not be social media would not be possible because the internet would have still been just a company only thing. But in the last few months or years, a shift happened. So the desktop is not as important anymore. People are not sitting in front of computers and type them in. We all have these things, so, or in some way or another, where we start surfing the internet. We got tablets. Like the whole market shifted from just sitting at home to doing it on the go, which is quite interesting. But at the same time, it's a challenge because it's not cheap. It's not. It's not a thing that everybody can afford. But uh, it doesn't really matter because the first thing that came out was like, yeah, HTML. Uh, a certain company from California, which is fruit related, I'm not going to say a name, actually released a smartphone and said the desktop is dead. Like, we only need this for all your things. And HTML5 is the main tool to do that. And that was great. I looked at HTML5 and I'm like, yes, 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 I've got video, I've got audio. I can do things that I couldn't do before. And then actually the same company realized that actually yeah, this HTML5 is nice, but with apps we make a lot of money. And we can sell you apps, and you, only for your phone and not for the other phone. So the HTML5 support in these phones are not as good as they promised. So a lot of things you can do on a desktop machine in HTML5, you cannot do on the mobile phone in HTML5. And that to me is unfair, this is wrong. Like, this is an open technology, you said you support it, so we need to bring HTML5 to the mobile web. And that's what we're doing with a few things that we have there. So right now there's a lockout happening. There's lots of cool stuff on the mobile web, like, oh my god, you can do this and this and this, you can check in with Foursquare. But in most cases, you need to have an iOS or Android device. And if you can't afford that, sorry, you don't get that content. You can't actually eat with the other one. So, and this to me is not the web. The web was built on the principle of, uh, it don't, doesn't matter what you use. You can use a text editor, you can use a browser. You should be allowed to participate in the web and get all the wonderful content. You shouldn't have to wait for the strawberry because you have to buy a phone for it. And that's wrong. And that's what we're doing something about this. And this is from Mozilla now, together with Telefonica came in and said, 
let's do something about this. We open the desktop. Now, what happens with mobile? Like, uh, what are we doing about the mobile market as well? And with that, I'm going to hand it over to John here. So indeed, um, the question is, how do we get from there to here? How do we uh, provide a complete experience on a mobile device? Um, we're already doing uh, with the desktop and the desktop browser. So this is actually coming from a site called AreWeMobileYet.com. Uh, one of the first things we needed to do, and indeed one of my first jobs uh, working with testing, was creating APIs that allow you to access the hardware directly from your HTML5, and more specifically from your JavaScript. So you need APIs for things like battery, WebGL, camera, uh, web context, full screen API, SMS, and of course telephony. I mean, you need to make, be able to make a phone call, right? So what are we, what are we able to do uh, with the phone calls that we need to be able to do with a, a phone call from a web de developed driver? Well, I mean, we need to be able to assess things like call state and control. So to control the call, you need to be able to call and answer and hang up. And uh, with call state, you need to understand what state is the call in. Is it busy? Is it dialing right now? Is it, is it connected? Et cetera. Is, is there an incoming call and so forth? So let's have a look at what this actually looks like in code. And those of you who are starting to glaze over, you know, take a, take a caffeine pill or something. Right. So at the very top line, we have this window navigator MOS telephony dial number. That's your basic telephony API. How, how do you dial a number from JavaScript? How are we enabling you to do this now? The next uh, several lines are kind of an elaboration of that. So well, when, we're, when we're dialing a call, of course we want to add um, an event listener, how does the state change and so forth. Um, we can answer, we can hang up. Um, do various things when, when we get the answer or the hang up call. So, with the web SMS API, we're able to do things like uh, control. We can send, delete, and find SMSs, and we can also interact. So, how do we find, filter, and view messages on our phone? Well, um, basic, basic the, the description of that is, you know, MOS, SMS, send the number of text, and you see an elaboration there. Uh, what do we do when we get an error? Uh, what do we do when we get a call back? Um, obviously, if we're able to do it in code, we're able to manipulate various other things that happen with this. So the idea is we can, we can create a richer experience than you're seeing with current telephony even now and in the fixed systems that are out there. Uh, with battery status, we can do things like uh, tell us if the battery is charging. We can check our battery level. Um, we have change events. Is that, did we go from uh, charging to discharging and so forth? I mean, the same thing with network info, right? Power management. Is our screen on and off? Or how do we adjust our brightness or our lock state? Things like that. So this is an example of battery. Um, we can see when the, when the charging uh, state changes, we can do something. Uh, when the level changes, we can do something. This is all possible now through JavaScript. Um, and this is this is a wonderful wonderful thing with these web APIs. But I almost forgot to mention is currently we have 21 working uh, hardware APIs, and we're making more. And this is going to make a lot of things possible. Um, we have our contacts manager where we can find, clear, save, and remove. We also have a possibility to search, find, filter, and sort contacts for a web. API. I mean, what kind of phone would you have if you didn't have contacts, right? Um, we can detect our screen orientation. We can also control the screen orientation. Maybe we have some things like dialer where we don't want the position on the screen to change when we rotate the phone. Um, obviously, there's still a lot of thinking to be done, um, but these things are starting to land in uh, W3C standards, so the stuff you're seeing in JavaScript now is going to be augmented by the work that we're driving. Uh, what can we do with our camera API? Well, picture size, video size, you zoom, you can have effects, you can have flash control, you can take pictures, um, video recordings, autofocus, um, set the quality, um, you can adjust the thumb size and all of that. Um, you can see from the bottom of the slide that this one is still very much in progress. So what we have is a truly open mobile US. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, it's uh, powered by HTML5. Yeah, that's a new one. 
that hasn't been there before. The, the, a lot of systems it's, uh, support HTML5, but they're actually not written in HTML5. So the operating system itself doesn't have any Java in it, doesn't have any C Sharp in it, or doesn't have any C++ or whatever in it. The whole thing is written like a website in itself. So the architecture is actually a three-fold. We have Gong, which is a low-level OS for B2B, which is actually the same Linux partition that we have for Android, because why reinvent the wheel when it's already working on that one? And then we got Gecko, and Gecko is the browser engine. It's the same browser engine that is in Firefox. So there's no surprises. The big problem as a web developer I always had was to build things on the desktop of Safari, for example, and then I looked at it on an iPhone, and it looked different, because these are not the same browsers. There are different rendering engine. With Gecko, we're going to have the same rendering engine on the desktop and on the, uh, on the mobile device as well. And Gaia is the user interface of Google Gecko. So Gaia is the biggest thing that we have here, which is always the thing that is visible. And Gaia in itself is just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So you can build your phone from these technologies, and that's something completely new. So this was on the flight over, where I was, uh, had five minutes not screaming kids around me, just showing you what the thing work looks like. This is a very old build of Gaia. This is not what it looks like nowadays. But you can see it's like any other smartphone. It got the, it got the icons, it got the scrolling. But when you hit the button here, and you actually go into your camera, you see that the whole thing is written in HTML itself, which means you have a phone that is like a website. What does that mean uh, for the future of this? And I think it's a very important part to consider this, is that there are endless opportunities. Like, you want to say you have a company, you want to have 400 phones for your people that work for you. Lucky you, you've got 400 people working for you. Well done. You want to have three applications that they can use on a phone. And you want to have a company logo above it. You go to Apple and say like, hey, can I have an iPhone with my logo on it? And they're like, no. Can I do something about it? No. Okay. Uh, hey, Google, can I have an Android phone with only three applications on it and my logo on it? Well, let's talk about it. Maybe it's possible in the future. You go to Mozilla and say like, does Google to Gecko allow me to put a picture there and three applications below it? Yeah, write an HTML page. So we can build the interface of mobile phones in HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. We don't have to wait for the next Android to come out and look completely different. We can change the problems that we have with it. And that gives us context-aware phones. Imagine a children's phone that would have basically just five buttons, like call home, call school, uh, order pizza, these kind of things, and have like a nice interface on top of it. That is possible. Imagine a phone that when you have another SIM card, you change from one provider to another, gets a completely different interface and gives you the possibilities that that provider has that the other provider didn't give you. Now you have to buy it from that provider and you have three different phones at home. With good to get we could switch according to that. So, of course, a smartphone without apps is pretty pointless. The apps is what people they don't want to go into the browser and start browsing. They want to have their games. They want to have their little things that do one thing and one thing well. So writing apps for Good to Gecko or for Firefox OS is as simple as writing an HTML document and writing a, uh, a, a manifest file which is in JSON. That manifest file tells us this is an application. It tells us what this application needs to do. So, for example, accessing the camera or making a call is not possible from every HTML or JavaScript that runs in Firefox OS. So if somebody installs that, it asks the user, this application wants to take pictures, is that okay with you? And you say yes, and then you can take pictures. If you say no, you get an error message and you can actually delete it accordingly. So this manifest file turns any website into an application, which is incredible. Because in the past, again, I had to write my own applications to install them on desktop as well. So when you write these open web apps for Mozilla's, or in Mozilla's style, you can actually run them in the browser as well. And they run it, uh, across different browsers. They work in Firefox, they work in Chrome, they work in Internet Explorer 10, they work in uh, Safari. And in Firefox, it would be with this install installation thing here, saying, like, okay, you want to install this application. This application then runs on your desktop the same way it runs uh, like native applications do. So on Windows it would be in your programs folder, on OS X it would be in your applications folder, on Linux it would be uh, also in the launcher, 
and then you basically have a full screen experience for your things. This is a game that was written in HTML5, and you can see it has the full, amount, uh, the full screen. It doesn't have a browser bar in there. It doesn't say, I'm running inside Firefox. It just looks like any other application that you have on your operating system. And this is possible just by writing in HTML and writing a manifest file. So what about making money? Of course, somehow, sooner or later, you want to make money with your stuff as well. And that's why a lot of people write native applications to make money with Apple or with Google. So, of course, we're going to have a marketplace as well. The marketplace is now open for developers. You can write applications and send them in. And it's going to be open for end users in a few months, not, not a long time. And then people can install these apps in Firefox and in the Firefox OS devices. And it works like any other marketplace out there. You can sell your apps. You can give them out for free. You can actually build people inside your apps for buying extra things like you can do with games on other platforms right now as well. And again, I gave you a puppy to make it go, oh, yeah, we have to help you. We want you to spread this message for us in Portuguese, in, Ch uh, in Chinese, in Spanish, whatever you speak and whoever you talk to. We want you to go out there and explain to people that this is in the making and we need developers to make it work. Because uh, an empty an app store is not really working, but a full app store with really cool stuff would be amazing. Imagine uh, the phone coming out and one of the games on there being yours. You can go to your mother and say like, look, the phone you just bought, I made that game, so don't tell me to cut my hair anymore, or things like that. So you can make your family proud by being the first one to do that. And you can use a text editor, you can use Vim, you can use whatever you want to build it. You don't have to be a Microsoft certified developer and use a certain tool to build your applications. You, build, you use the same tools you use to build websites out there. So how do you get started? On developermozilla.org, FDN apps is everything you need to know about applications, how they're actually built, how you can put them together, and where you can send them later on. So what if you want to have Firefox OS right now? That's what people say. Like, yeah, you talk about Firefox OS. How can I get it in my hand? How can I play with it? So uh, with that, I'm going to talk quickly about what you're trying to uh, You have a few possibilities right now. Unfortunately, for various reasons, we, um, we can't give out ready builds. What we can do is we can give you uh, what's, what's known as a desktop build. So you can, uh, a couple of commands you can run. You can basically get a build of uh, what the guy called it runs in your, in your desktop. Um, another possibility is to do this thing using our Firefox nightly. So you can get a version of Gaia that runs right in, right inside of our Firefox nightly. You know, it doesn't work on um, the beta builds, but it does work in our nightly build. So there's the desktop builds for Windows, and Linux, and Mac OS, and there's also the, the Firefox nightly stuff as well, which you can try. Um, it's relatively easy to set up. Um, I should mention that the Windows desktop build is extremely easy to use, and Felipe just showed it to me today. So these are brand new things that our community is making right now. Um, and in the spirit of that, I want to show that as you're a part of the community, you're going to make things like this possible as well. Yeah, and the good thing about that one is when you use the Nike build, for example, you've got all the development tools that come in, in Firefox as well, so you can actually edit your applications in the browser directly before you have to go back to your editor, which is a very, very powerful thing to have. And it's quite cool in the last year, browsers have become these editing tools, much like only the displaying tools of the internet. The, uh, the interesting thing about, one, about that one is as well that this is cool, this is nice, of course you want to play with Firefox OS. But what we really need is people to write applications. You're not going to build Firefox OS, you're not going to build your own phone. Or you, don't, you shouldn't have to. But the applications will run into that one. So for testing your applications, this is great. But don't spend too much time getting too excited about hacking the system itself, unless you want to you want to sell your own phones with Firefox OS on them. If that's the case, come to us and talk to us about it. I think it's incredible to have this little editor to see the thing live on your machine as well. And uh, when we say it's the Firefox Nightly only right now, never forget that we have a six week release cycle. So Firefox Nightly now, in half a year's time, is Firefox. So it's not that much of a problem anymore. And of course, when people ask me about these things, so where's the metal? Like, this is cool, like, you could show me the emulator and everything. What about the hardware? Where do I get a phone? What does the phone look like? 
and it's quite fun to see like Sepultura doing that dog. I don't know what they're doing there, but it's quite interesting to see. And yes, we have phones. Um, they're hard to come by, but who you talk to is actually the Vivo people or Telefonica. They are the ones that are partnering with us to bring the phone into the hands of people in a few months' time, as far as I heard. And you go to the website openwebdevice.com, and there you can actually see them in action, a video in action, how what they look like. And we have a few here if you want to quickly show one. Just like this is what they look like at the moment. These are just test platforms, but these phones will be available through Telefonica Vivo here in Brazil in not a long time for a very, very affordable price. And that is the idea of Firefox OS. We're not there to actually kill what's there right now. We're there to bring the web to people who don't have it yet. So a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, you're going to take on iOS and Android now. And I don't think we're going to have the static numbers of Android anytime soon. And I don't think we need to. The main idea of Firefox OS is to bring the web to people who now have an old Nokia phone or an old Samsung phone that only allows them to send text messages. It will be as affordable as those phones, and it will be web-enabled. And this is why we started that whole thing. We came up with the idea of having a web phone. And then, funnily enough, Telefonica came up to us and said, like, we had that idea as well, we just heard that you're working on it. Can we partner on that rather than work against each other? And of course, that was a very good idea, because Mozilla is not there to give out phones. We're not a hardware company, and we're not going to build hardware or send it out. Google tried to do that with the Nexus One, that didn't work, so we're not going to do it anytime soon, and it doesn't make sense for us. But we built the operating system under that, and we help partners like Telefonica to bring the phone out into the market. And this is what Firefox OS is about. So, talk to us and talk about us. All the information about Butu Gecko is available. Butu Gecko is the product name of Firefox OS internally, so it's a bit of a confusing thing. Uh, there's Good to Gecko and Moss Hacks on Twitter, where we throw out all the information that we have when new things are coming in. There's a platform mailing list where everything happens that is happening in Firefox. There's IRC channels on irc.mozilla.org, the channel B2G. There's a repository on GitHub, there's the architecture on the wiki, there's the Gaia repository on GitHub as well. The developer docs are available on the developermozilla.org, and the web API docs are available on the wiki. So, nothing in this phone. Nothing in this operating system is closed. Everything is publicly available for you to play with, to fix, to help us with, and this is so cool. Android is awesome, but waiting for Android is not awesome. Android is not open source to me, it's Tada source. Like, Tada, we have a new version open, and now you can get it. And then the code kit is available in three weeks' time. And with Boot Together, you can build the thing with us while it's happening rather than having to wait for us to bring out the new version that you are unhappy with. So the last thing to cover is that uh, we also have a program about making you the star. So uh, there's no way we can fly over every single time there's an event in Brazil, because it is a long flight and we're, we're old. And it makes much more sense to actually uh, support people here and internally in other countries. So I'm running a program in Mozilla called the Adventures and Reps Program, this means that if you want to be a speaker or you want to do an event for Mozilla about the open web, about Firefox OS, or about HTML5, then come to us and talk to us about it. We can give you slide decks. We can give you one-on-one -on -one training, like a Skype call, how you can improve your training skills. You can, uh, you can learn from us how to give a good presentation, how to write blog posts, how to write good code examples. And all this material that we're doing, all these trainings, I'm doing one in, uh, um, in uh, Sao Paulo before I fly back in a day's time. All these materials are available on the wiki as well. So if you want to give this presentation, the slides are available. They're creative comments, they're open for you to use. I didn't violate any copyrights with them, and you shouldn't either, but it's just wonderful to share this information, because I want people worldwide to know they can speak for Mozilla if they speak the right language. So if you need some training up, if you're interested in speaking that, come to us and talk to us later as an email where you can send uh, uh, your application on. And look at the REPS training program. There's lots of stuff in there that helps you even in your job. If you have to give a presentation to your boss, there's some good tips in there on how to become a better speaker. John just started in this program, so I got him having dragged him here on stage without him wanting to. So give him a good hand afterwards because he managed to do it. 
And this is basically all we have. So thanks very much for that. Thank you.